Isaiah 63, and I'll read the first six verses. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trod the, uh, trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood life spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought my salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled on the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Well, the first uh, six verses of this chapter do uh, speak of God's vengeance. In one sense, they come a little bit uh, as a surprise. We've uh, seen chapters that are very much talking about the redemption of Jerusalem, the hope of the whole earth. But in one sense, uh, this is really the implication of these last uh, chapters. Uh, they do talk about the end, uh, but we've seen already in chapter 59 at the end is a day of vengeance as well as being the year of the Lord's uh, favor. Uh, we've got to understand what um, Isaiah means here by vengeance. I guess in common use, usage, uh, vengeance is the opposite of love, is being sort of uh, spiteful all, almost. But uh, vengeance in the Bible, uh, God's vengeance, is uh, his right and just uh, albeit personal payment for wrongs done. Uh, vengeance, uh, when God executes it, it, it is good and right. And the focus of vengeance here uh, is uh, Edom. Uh, they're mentioned. Uh, who is this who comes from Edom? And then we have this description of, of vengeance, the implication being that he's executed it on Edom, Osra, city in Edom. And uh, we saw this uh, earlier in Isaiah that Edom was kind of uh, uh, a uh, singled out uh, for God's judgment and that is something that runs throughout the Old Testament. Um, Edom very close, uh, Jacob and Esau, Edom descended from Esau, the very close relationship made um, uh, their uh, kind of antagonism um, particularly kind of painful and particularly sinful on Edom's part really. Um, and uh, Numbers 20, they wouldn't let uh, Israel journey through their land um, from Egypt to get to the promised land. Amos 1 talks about a perpetual uh, hatred. Uh, but what we're seeing here is that for Edom to be uh, spiteful and uh, to set itself against Israel was to set itself against God. God is the one who takes vengeance. Uh, Edom might think that they were just being political and uh, just being uh, shrewd in opposing their neighbor, but they were opposing God. And we're reminded of Paul uh, or Saul, uh, as he was uh, identified in Acts, when um, uh, he persecutes the church, and then the Lord Jesus confronts him. Uh, Paul, Paul, why, or, sorry, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not just why are you persecuting the church, but why are you persecuting me? And that that is um, uh, the focus of these uh, first uh, few verses. They are confronting the the, the language is like the revelation, uh, the language of revelation with uh, with blood. And uh, this reminder that uh, verse 4, you know, we, we think of, of God being a God of love, which he is, but he is also a God of vengeance. Verse 4, for the day of vengeance was in my heart. And again, we're reminded of what Paul says in Romans 11. Remember the, severity, the kindness and the severity of God. And uh, we're probably more uh, inclined to remember God's kindness, but we've also got to remember God's severity. And so, uh, you know, we, we remember that uh, in our sinful state, we deserve God's vengeance, God's uh, judgment against us. And it's only because of the work of the Lord Jesus, the suffering servant who's taken the punishment that we deserve, that we don't need to experience uh, this uh, vengeance. But it's also very important to see God's vengeance on his enemies is salvation for his, peoples and for his people. And that's what's uh, the point that's made in verse 5. My own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. So salvation and vengeance uh, go together. Uh, verse 7, though, uh, marks a, a, a change um, here, and it's, it's a prayer of intercession that actually runs through to the end of chapter, uh, 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 chapter 64. And it's a prayer uh, for God to act. Uh, we, we've just seen God's vengeance. It's as if um, we're, we're back when um, 
in, in Isaiah's own time or in the time of the exile, when, you know, God's people were being persecuted by, the, by their enemies. So it's a prayer for God to act um, and to have mercy on his people and to enact the judgment and vengeance that we've just seen. And so verses 7 to 14 uh, begin with kind of Isaiah recalling God's mercy. If you look at it, it's, it's really interestingly structured. 7 to 9, uh, uh, Isaiah remembers God's steadfast love and um, uh, you know, the fact that in, uh, Israel experienced God's uh, goodness. Uh, verse 8, surely they are my people. Um, he became their savior. Uh, verse 9, in, in love, he, in, he redeemed them so, uh, and, and he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. So that, that idea that you know, they were taken out of Exodus because of God's love, because they were his people. But verse 10, they rebelled and so they became his, uh, his enemies. Um, but verses 11 to 14 even though they rebelled, they're like his enemies. Verses 11 to 14 is, in a sense, God remembers. Um, obviously, that's using human language of God. God never forgets anything, but he, he remembers the days of old and Moses, uh, his people. And so then he acts uh, to, to save them again. And uh, verse um, 13, he led them through the, the depths. Verse 14, like livestock that go into the valley, the spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make yourself a glorious uh, name so that that's the pattern uh, Lord you did it in uh, Exodus when we you know we, we were your people you had mercy on us but then first 10 we became uh, rebels but then you still remembered us and you still had mercy on us and so the implication is I, I guess we you know we yes we may be in the situation of verse 10 um, you, you are allowing enemies to to trample on us because we have rebelled against you but remember what you did in the past you you uh, uh, remembered who we are and you had mercy on us and that's uh, from verse 15 to the end of verse 60 uh, to the end of chapter 64 that is the the, the prayer uh, that God would um, uh, have mercy and uh, uh, it starts with verse 15 look down from heaven and see uh, from your holy and beautiful habitation uh, where are your zeal and your might? Why aren't you saving us? The storing of your story, stirring of your inner parts and your compassion are held back from me because you are our father. Um, you're our father, even though Abraham doesn't know us and Israel doesn't acknowledge us. I guess the sense here is even though we're not living the way that we should, um, you're still our father. And so uh, it, it, really interesting, verse 17, why, why do you make us wander from our ways? And harden our hearts so that we fear you not. It's a very bold prayer on Isaiah's part. You know, he's sort of saying, look, Lord, you're sovereign. You're sovereign over our hearts. If we're wandering from you, it's because you're causing us to. And it's interesting, you know, Romans 1, talking about Gentiles, you know, who um, turned their back on God and God gave them over to their sin. So there's a sense in which, yes, the hardness of their hearts is a result of God's judgment. And Isaiah's praying, Lord, reverse that judgment. And so verse 17, return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage, your holy people held possession for a, a little while because our adversaries have trampled on your sanctuary. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who are not called by your name. It's a really interesting prayer. Um, you know, Isaiah saying, yes, we deserve to be under your, God, under your judgment, but you're the one who's hardened our hearts so that we remain in this way. Please change us so that we'll repent. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating prayer. It continues in chapter 64. Uh, we've just seen uh, Isaiah ask that uh, the Lord would look down and see. Chapter 64, it's come down and, and save us. Uh, so it's, it's a prayer that acknowledges um, their sin and their falling from God, but it also um, acknowledges that only God can change them. Only God can change them. Uh, why don't we pray? Our Father, we thank and praise you uh, for the the, uh, uh, the truths that are revealed in this chapter, uh, that you love your people, uh, but that you will uh, judge them when they sin, but you are the one who can turn them back to yourself. And we do pray that this would be true of us when we're tempted to, uh, to wander away from you. You would keep our hearts uh, from becoming hard, and we would always uh, trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.